Well, good morning, and uh, and welcome to our virtual service. Um, we uh, expect that God is going to work in your heart and your life as you watch these. Uh, we don't have an opportunity to be together, so we'll have to be together apart. And uh, and we love you guys. I want to thank you also those who've been faithful to continue to give your offerings and tithes either by our uh, PayPal button or or dropping checks off here at the church. Uh, you're keeping this place going, so uh, it's it's really vitally important, and uh, I really appreciate you doing that, and, and I'm sure the Lord will bless you as you continue to give. We love you guys, and uh, I want to open with a, a little reading from the Daily Bread. I won't make a habit of this, it just happened to reach out to me when I read it uh, Friday morning. <clears throat> so this is uh, the, the uh, scripture verses from Romans 11.33, which says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. And this is what the writer uh, writes in relation to that. He says, uh, I was deeply troubled and woke in the night to pace the floor with, and pray. Frankly, my attitude was not one of prayer and prayerful submission to God, but it was one of questioning and anger. Finding no release, I sat and stared out a large window at the night sky. I was unexpectedly drawn to, to focus on Orion's belt, those three perfectly aligned and arranged stars, uh, often visible on clear nights. I knew just enough about astronomy to understand that those three stars were hundreds of light years apart. I realized the closer I could be to those stars, the less they would appear to be aligned. Yet from my distant perspective, they looked carefully configured in the heavens. At that moment, I realized I was too close to my life to see what God sees. In his big picture, everything is perfectly aligned. The Apostle Paul, as he, as he completes a summary of the ultimate purpose of God, breaks into a hymn of praise. His words lift our gaze to the sovereign God, whose ways are beyond our limited ability to understand or trace. Yet, the one who holds all things together in the heavens and on earth is intimately and lovingly involved every detail of our lives. Even when things seem confusing, God's divine plans are unfolding for our good and for God's honor and glory. What questions do you long for God to answer? How can you find rest and release from the uh, through faith, rather, uh, that his perspective of our lives is in perfect alignment with his ultimate purpose. Dear God, remind me that your purposes and plans for my life are beyond my understanding and help me rest in you. I thought that was particularly relevant for us. Um, our perspective is skewed right now. Uh, we're seeing the four walls of our own homes and and not being able to get out and do the things we want to do. And yet, uh, if, we, if we could zoom out to God's perspective, which is impossible, but imagine if you could, if we could zoom out to God's perspective, He sees everything as it's supposed to be. And He knows where every one of us are, and He has us in the palm of His hand. And that's reassuring. So today I felt like focusing more on God's uh, sovereignty and power um, as we sing together. You ready? Okay, I want to be able to hear you over here, so sing loud. Great are you, Lord, mighty in the strength. You are faithful, and you will never be. He will praise you. Days. It's for 
awesome in power, our God, our God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah.
because you are everywhere. You with those at home, you with those watching from their phones, you're with us, Lord. You promise to be. And at this time, we want to acknowledge your strength, your power, your sovereignty over all creation. Wherever we are, whatever we're feeling, whatever we're going through, our circumstances are in your hands, and you have the perfect perspective. So we pray that you would bless this time, honor your word, speak to your people, and bring us your peace. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, good morning. Glad we could be together again today as we continue on in our Made to Wait series. Uh, today we're going to talk about the God who waits with us. And we're going to look at the life of Joseph. But before we do that, I, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who continue to, to tithe, to give, to contribute uh, to the church um, in these days and in these times. Uh, it makes all the difference. And to be quite honest with you, if you don't, I'm going to be a man without a job. But uh, in any case, all joking aside, I, I want to say thank you and God bless you. Uh, you encourage those who, uh, who are in the church serving and, uh, and the message continues to go out and we continue to seek the Lord in everything that we do. So thank you. Uh, today, as we look at Joseph's life, um, well, you know that in the, the email I sent you, uh, Joseph's life is, is just a, a wonderful story, and it's covered in Genesis 37 and then 39 to 50. So there's a lot of ground, which of course we couldn't read all of that in one time. Um, but I, I just want to say to you that uh, you're going to see and understand, I think, and hope and pray, uh, of how God works in our lives. I want to ask you, do you know what the, what, what the future holds for you? We can think that we know what the future holds for us. We might have thought that before COVID-19 showed up. We had plans for this year. We had things that we were going to do, places that we maybe wanted to visit, and people we wanted to spend time with. And obviously, none of that has taken place. So, do you think you know what the future holds for you? Well, Joseph, I'm sure, like anyone else who has a pulse, thought that he probably knew what the future might hold for him. We join him at a point in his life when he is only 17. Young, you remember what it was like to be a teenager? Arrogant, uh, cocky, maybe overconfident. And we're going to, to meet up with this young man and we're going to find a life that was good but became troubled. Uh, I'd like to say we're going to experience the journey of a, a, a man who, a young man who's, who, who experiences pain and it redirects his life. But to start with, Joseph had a pretty good life. He was one of many brothers and he was uh, a favorite of his father's. Um, when, we, when we joined Joseph in Genesis 37, we find out that uh, he is a favored son. And the verse goes like this, Now Israel, which is another name for Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Loved him more. He was favored. You kind of get to see a picture painted of a young man who uh, was the apple of his father's eye. Not only was he the apple of his father's eye and favored, his father openly expressed it. He made a robe, uh, and, and put it on him, and it kind of made him stand out among his brothers, and because of that, his brothers became angry with him and jealous. Uh, and then on top of that, God gave Joseph dreams. And not only did he give Joseph dreams, but he also gave Joseph the interpretation of those dreams. So ultimately, uh, as young as he was, I don't, you know, Joseph couldn't handle the, the gifts that he was given, and um, he, because of that, he ended up irritating his brothers by talking about his dreams, and, and uh, they just began to despise him. And it got to the point where they became so upset with him that they kidnapped him. They faked his death. He came out to meet his brothers one day uh, out on the fields as they were tending the sheep, and they, they wrestled him down and they threw him into an empty well, an empty dry well. 
And then they sold him off to a caravan that was heading to Egypt. And he went up on the sales block and he was sold as a slave. They hated him that much. Obviously, this is not what Joseph was thinking when, it talked, when he thought about his future and what might be in store for him. Well, as the story goes on, as Joseph's in Egypt, he gets purchased by an official of Pharaoh's by the name of Potiphar. And he goes into Potiphar's home. And in a short amount of time, he becomes trusted by Potiphar. In fact, he rises to the head of staff. But why does this happen? Well, Genesis 39.2 tells us the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. God was with him. So you see, Joseph is uprooted. His life is changed. But there's someone who goes with him, someone who is watching over him, someone who will spend the time in his journey. And life is good for him. Things are going well. It seems like his life is settled until Potiphar's wife gets a hold of Joseph and literally tries to get a hold of Joseph. He's young, he's handsome, he's attractive, and um, she is coming on to him in plain English day after day after day after day after day. And every day he refuses her for two main reasons. One, because he respected his master. He had full run of the house and everything and everyone on the property. But he respected his master because that was his wife. And the other thing was he did not want to do wrong before God because of his faith. And so he refused Potiphar's wife until one day when nobody else was in the house, she got a hold of him. And because she wouldn't let go, Potiphar left his cloak and ran out. She then accused him of trying to rape her, told the story to her husband, and her husband threw him into prison. Uh, turned for the worst, if, if you ask me. It's not enough that he sold it to slavery, but now he's thrown into prison for something he did not do. But he's not left. The same God that was with him, that when he went through the time in the, in the, in the pit, the same God who was with him when he was sold into slavery, is now with him in prison. He's not alone. And what happens is, God arranges for Joseph to meet up with two individuals. Um, we're told in Genesis 39 that Joseph was in prison, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. God was involved in what was going on. Two individuals show up in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and chief baker. Apparently, at some point, they uh, ticked Pharaoh off. He got angry with them and he threw them into prison. And soon after they arrived in prison, each one of them received a dream. And so Joseph saw them one day and he saw that they were kind of downcast. And they were downcast, they were upset because they didn't know what these dreams meant. And so Joseph asked them, what's upsetting you? And they told him. And then Joseph, in turn, began to interpret their dreams. And it turned out that both of their interpretations of their dreams came to pass. For the baker, it wasn't a good outcome. But for the cupbearer, he ended up back in Pharaoh's service. And Joseph, before he left, asked him to remember him when he got before Pharaoh because he, he didn't belong in that prison. He didn't do anything wrong, right? So what happens is the cupbearer gets out, but we're told that, um, that the cupbearer forgot him. Genesis 40, 23 tells us the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And we're talking now insult to injury. Think of it this way. Joseph gets dumped. You ever go to a pool or out to the ocean? You ever get pummeled by a wave? I did when I was younger. You ever play with friends in the pool and uh, what the, 
your, your friend might be strong, was stronger than you and dumped you down and held you under and let you back up. And then when you came out and you just got just maybe a little bit of air, dumped you back under. Think of Joseph this way. Joseph gets dumped by his brothers. He's sold into slavery. He, he comes and he works for Potiphar. Then Joseph gets dumped by Potiphar's wife, accused and lied about. And then he's in prison. And now he helps the cupbearer, and he gets dunked by the cupbearer, in essence. Held under, because he's forgotten. But there's going to come a time now where Joseph's going to come up for air. Joseph is coming up for air. See, what happens is, Pharaoh, two years later, has a dream. Actually, he has two dreams, but both the messages of those dreams are one and the same. And nobody can help Joseph with those dreams. And then all of a sudden, the cupbearer has a V8 moment. Remember the old V8 juice commercials? Where all of a sudden, the person works up and says, you know, what am I doing? I could have had a V8. Right? Well, the cupbearer had like a V8 moment. And he realizes, you know what, Pharaoh? I know no one can help you, but I met someone in prison, and I had a dream, and the chief baker had a dream, and this man, this Hebrew, interpreted those dreams, and it helped us. I mean, they came true. So Pharaoh immediately sent for Joseph. They cleaned him up. He came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh told him the dreams. And Joseph was, was able to interpret the dreams. Basically, Joseph told him, listen, Pharaoh, these dreams, even though there are two, they are one and the same. And the bottom line was that God was sending, God was sending a famine on the land. But before he would do that, they would have seven years of plenty. I mean, the crops that would, that would be grown in those years would be far greater than they've ever experienced. But right after that, they would have seven years of famine. And then Joseph went to lay out a plan for Pharaoh about how they should store the, the, the abundance of their crops and how they should be prepared for the famine and how they should have storehouses and warehouses in each city and, and to, to be able to take care of the people over the long haul of famine. And listen to what, what Pharaoh thinks and what, what he, he, he goes ahead and does. Genesis 41, 37 and 38. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the Spirit of God? Joseph's up for air. He is going to go from a battered sibling to a slave to a wrongfully accused and imprisoned man to the head of all Egypt, just shy of Pharaoh's position. But look at the time that had to be spent waiting for that to happen. Not even sure if it was going, if anything good was going to come of it. Thirteen years had passed. Thirteen years from the time he was taken from his home to the time that he came into position under Pharaoh. And Pharaoh hasn't run with it. In all that time, God not only did not forget about Joseph, but he had a plan and a purpose for Joseph. I think it's easy for any of us right now to think, where is God in all this? But I want to tell you that God knew what was going to happen before it happened. And God has a plan in all of this, just as he did for Joseph. I believe a wonderful plan that may not be visible and clear to us now, but that he is going to reveal over time as he did for Joseph. Joseph goes on to understand that God was orchestrating something bigger than his own life, something beyond his own self-centered life, something that would not only benefit him, but benefit those around him. Yeah. Amazingly, Joseph then goes on to serve Pharaoh, serve the nation of Egypt, 
And when the famine hits, when the famine hits, people had food to eat because of the plan that God had implemented through and in Joseph. Isn't that wonderful? And not only would it save the people of Egypt, but it would begin to have its effects far-reaching beyond their own land to other nations, like those of his family back in Canaan. Because the famine hit them, hit Jacob his father and all his brothers and their entire family. To one point where the father said, there is a man in Egypt who has food. You need to go. And so he sent them. And they went. And, and it's an incredible story. I really do encourage you, if you haven't, this week, to read the week to come, Joseph's story in Genesis. Because you see that his brothers up and go. They bring silver, and they, they go to buy the grain, and they meet up with Joseph, but they don't know it's their brother. But he identifies them. And he plays, he plays head games with them. He, he, he gives them the grain, but he puts the silver back in their pouch. And he makes it so that they, they, they are besides themselves and fearful. What is going on? They don't understand it. And, and he manages to, to, to manipulate them to have to come back and, and have to face him. And he, he just, God just works in this whole thing. And they come to understand that this is their brother. And they think that it's their end of their life. Because now he's in Egypt and he had the power to lock them up, to enslave them, to do just about anything he wanted to do with them. But Joseph wouldn't, because Joseph understood that God had orchestrated the things that took place. That God used his life to bring about good for a great many people. Listen to what, uh, what uh, Joseph says. Now, it's not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to read it. It's from Genesis 45, verses 5 to 8. This is what Joseph says to his brothers after he reveals himself to them. And they are in utter shock and amazement. That, it, that number one, that he, that he is standing before them, that he is actually the head of Egypt. And now, do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping. In other words, no harvesting. But God sent me. Listen. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not by you who sent me here, but by God. But by God. But by God, he made me the father of Pharaoh, lord of the entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Do you see? Do you see what God has done? Do you have a sense of that? You see, God was involved, intricately involved in everything that took place. And I want to challenge you to think about it this way. Do you think that God is absent from this time? Do you think that God didn't know COVID-19 was going to hit us? Do you think that he would, would leave us out on our own? That he is not with us in this? That he is not bringing about new things for our own lives, for the life of this church, and for any of us out there who has probably thought they knew what this year, 2020, or hoped what this 2020 year would bring them, and then all of it got dashed. Do you think God has been absent from that? When you think about Joseph's life, I think you know what the answer to that is. He is not absent. In fact, he has been intricately involved in all of this. 
He has a purpose and a plan for us. Maybe some of you are being used for a purpose for someone else. What will God bring about through this time? Joseph was able to see that God was involved in everything, in his father's favoritism that made him stand out and become a target to his brothers, in his own youthful arrogance. I mean, Joseph had dreams where he was, he was telling his brothers, you're going, to be, you're, going to be, you're going to bow down to me. That mom and dad are going to bow down to me. And you know what? They all come to Egypt, and that's exactly what happens, ends up happening. They bow down to him. God was involved. God was bringing him out. Joseph got to see that God was involved in that, even in the line of Potiphar's wife, placing him and, and maneuvering him into prison so that he would be involved in the life of the cupbearer who would be involved in the life of Pharaoh. Even the two years that Joseph waited in that prison was a part of God's plan. Hard to think in terms like that. That God would allow us to wait, maybe even make us wait at different times of our lives because he is orchestrating something that is far beyond what we could ever think or imagine. Because God is God. His timing is not our timing. His ways are not our ways. We can, we can hang our heads and think, what a horrible time. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of sadness to be, to be had at this time with COVID-19. But God is not absent, and God is doing things in it that you and I may not be able to understand or even see. But if we have the faith to believe and to look for Him in it, I believe that we're going to see God doing things that we would have never thought could, be ever done, could have been done. Why, even in Joseph's brother's hatred and jealousy, God was using it all. All of it. None of it went to waste. It was a picture painted for him. And at the end of Joseph's life, he was able to say this in Genesis 50, 20. You, meaning his brothers, Intended to harm me. <laughs> when you threw me in that hole in that pit, you intended to harm me. When you sold me into slavery, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good. God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I want to tell you that we can look at what we are all going through and the harm and the sadness that many are experiencing in this time, the uncertainty, the, the, the confusion, the chaos, and think, oh, this is, what is going to come of this? But I want to say to you, whatever you and I can imagine is intending to harm us or cause us to fear and be frightened and, and to, to be doubting and wondering what's going to come of our lives, God will use it for good. God will use it for good. We're going to pick up more on this next week when we, when we, when we meet up with Jesus. And we'll see that God allows certain things, but He has a purpose involved in it. He's doing something that you and I cannot understand. But if we look and we wait and we realize that He waits with us, the great orchestrator of our souls, the God who knows all things, who has set all things in motion, who has planned out this world from beginning to end, and if He has done that with the entire world, how much more with your life and my life? How much more? Before we go today, I want to share a verse with you, two verses from Lamentations that, has been, that have really been with me uh, in these last couple of weeks. In fact, um, I would say that, that uh, this was part, in part a spark to, uh, to the series, uh, Made to Wait. And in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, it says this, 
The Lord is good. Do you believe that? Do you believe the Lord is good? Even in spite of what's happening in our world today? Do you believe God is good? That is incapable of evil. If you believe that, if you're open to even open to that suggestion, join us next week. Join us next week. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. What have you and I been placing our hope in before COVID-19 happened? What? The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him. Maybe some of us, before this all happened, we, we spent time seeking God. Maybe we could have done, we can always do better, right? I know I can. But, you know, what, what were you spending time doing? What were you seeking for your life? What did you think what was, was in your best interest? What was in my best interest? The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him. To the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly. I don't know. Easier said than done. Do those words push a button in you? It is good to wait quietly. Do we agree with that? Can we go there? Can we dare to reflect on that? The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you understand? Um, I believe personally that, that God is always more concerned about our souls and our, our, our overall destination and landing point when this life is over. More concerned about that than this. Than my frame. Than how I feel from one day to another. Not that he doesn't love me and not that he doesn't care about me and my physical well-being. But he's more concerned for my soul. And that is far more important to him than anything else. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you, do I know what God is truly working in this time and revealing to people and their need for Him? Because when something like this happens in our life and in our world, the bottom, the, the rug gets pulled out from us, the bottom drops out, and we're free falling. But into whose arms are we going to land? Whose? The government's? into His, because He has been in this with us. He has been involved in your life and in my life from the day of conception until the day we, we exit. In it all, He has everything orchestrated. And can we go there? Can we trust Him? Can we believe that like with Joseph, at the end, we will understand better what God has in mind for us? Because it is bigger than you and I. It's bigger than just me and you. It's about others. And does any of us know? Joseph was made to wait. He was made to suffer. Does, let's, not, let's not mix words here. God allowed him, made him even suffer. But God was with him, and God was waiting him. Should not be hard to, to understand when we look at Christ who was also sent and made to wait in the form of a man and made to suffer. And for what purpose? For the salvation of mankind, for the world. If we would just be willing to reach out and take hold of it and accept the gift that God has given us through Christ. God is working in ways that you and I can't understand. And though we might suffer for a time, God has something wonderful in mind. Don't we have to grieve with others who are losing lost ones? And by the way, my heart goes out to every family who has lost someone. But I want to say to you, God knows our times. 
He knows the day that I'm going to breathe my last breath. He knows it. It's in his hands. And as Frankie prayed this morning before we got started, we are at a place to surrender ourselves today. By the way, you don't know it, but I have Frank pray for you, for me, for the, sir, for the message before we even roll. And his prayer was just that, oh God, we surrender ourselves to you. We give this time over to you. And I want to add to that, we give our lives to you because they belong to you. Our lives, your life, your existence, my existence belongs to God. Just as Joseph's did. All of our lives do. God is involved in us and he is showing us a way. A way to go through this. And he has not left us on our own to go through it by ourselves. Yes, he has given us seek one another. But in those moments when nobody else is around and all those thoughts go swirling around your head and your fears and your doubts start crawling up around your neck and start to choke you. He is present. He is there. He is there for you and me to turn to. To ask for help. And I don't care if you've been a Christian for God knows how many years. I'm going to tell you, I'm calling on Him every day for help. But maybe you haven't begun to call on Him for help. Maybe it, it never crossed your mind. Or maybe it did, but then you quickly brushed it away. I want to tell you, now is the time to call on him for help if you would just believe that he has your life in his sight. That he has your future. And he has a plan for your life much greater, much bigger than you can ever imagine. Because his plans don't, don't merely concern this life, but they concern one to come for all eternity. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares for us. That's how much he cares for you. He has laid it out. He has a plan. And it is for the good of all of us that we spend this time to seek him, to understand that God is in it with us. He is the God who waits with us. You know, you, uh, you have had this opportunity to see this picture um, you don't see anybody on the bench next to this young lady. But trust me when I tell you it's not empty. The invisible God is there. He is waiting. He waits with you. He waits with me. We nearly, near, we just merely need to trust Him. To turn to Him. Let's pray. Father, You are good. Your plans are wonderful. Lord, help us to realize that they involve not only mountains, but valleys, dark woods. Not only green pastures, but trials, curves, and challenges, debris, obstacles. Lord, help us to seek you in this time and to believe that you have something wonderful in mind for each of us if we would only turn to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And thank you for listening. All right, let's sing together.
Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your presence via your spirit. And we pray you bless your people as we go into a new week, looking for you, seeking you. Open our eyes to see you where you are, to see you in our places, to trust you, to know you're in control. You have all things in perspective, including our lives. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Have a great day. Well, thank you for joining us. We hope to, uh, to see you or be seen by you next week. Uh, as we are going to continue in the Made to Wait series, and we're going to uh, visit in with uh, Jesus and a family uh, that consisted of two sisters and a brother. Hope you'll join us. See you then. Bye now.